work here as an employee, but I also own one share of the company. I have a say in what happens with the company, which is, which is awesome. We have a stake. We have skin in the game, as they say. It's a real business. We have goals to meet, but there's just this environment that we all love what we're doing, and it's very meaningful to us, and we all want it to work. I have worked at large corporations where there's a huge hierarchy. It takes a lot of energy to operate in an environment like that. We put our energy towards our projects and our products. Most other companies, I couldn't share in the decision making because I wouldn't have a vote. And at the end of the day, if the work I did produced profit, I wouldn't get to share in that because it would be going somewhere else. Um, if I was concerned about what this was doing to the community, if I worked for another business, that wouldn't matter. Cualquier empresario del exterior le dirá que lo más importante sea sacar el máximo beneficio. Nosotros decimos que la rentabilidad y el beneficio es importante para sostener a la empresa, pero que también es muy importante la generación de empleo. We believe that it isn't good for anybody if somebody loses their job. If you lose your job, you haven't got money. If you haven't got money, you can't buy. If you can't buy, you can't buy our product. El reparto de la riqueza más equitativa llega a más personas y por lo tanto más personas tienen la posibilidad de vivir más o menos bien. La empresa es nuestra, pero somos trabajadores también, ¿no? Entonces no hay como un jefe que pueda haber en otras empresas, ¿no? Todos somos nuestros jefes y todos tenemos que tirar eh, para adelante con la empresa. La gran mayoría de las personas se integre más, se envuelva más y por tanto podemos ser más competitivos y competir con la empresa más mejor de, del mundo. Es el futuro, entendemos, del, del mundo laboral también. En aquella sociedad anónima era realmente la sensación de trabajar para otro, acabar la, el, la obra y a casa y, y se acabó. Esto es algo como que forma parte más de nuestra vida. ¿no? porque tomamos parte desde la cabeza hasta la cola de la organización. ¿no? Al final que tenemos trabajo, que es muy importante. Muchas veces hay empresas que son capitalistas, si hay un tipo de paro, pues vas a la calle. Habrá unos que salen mal y otros mejor, pero tienes trabajo, no te mandan a la calle. Eh, soy la segunda generación de una familia cooperativista. Las tres hermanas somos socias en favor. Lo han hecho la generación de mis padres, nos lo han dejado en, en herencia y tenemos que seguir trabajando para dejar esa herencia a nuestros hijos. Companies in this era of capital and job mobility are not really anchored in place. They're not really loyal to the communities in which they reside. And so as companies come and go from our communities, it kind of rips the economic underpinnings. People losing their homes, the foreclosure crisis here, it's just been devastating. They say you keep doing the same old thing, you get the same results. And people are looking for results right now that's going to make a difference in people's lives. We give incentives to businesses and they come into a town and they say, well, we're going to move here and we give them some money and in 10 years when the incentive's over, they say, well, what town should we move to next? This was a unique idea that people would own the business. So the business can't pick up and move unless every single person who uh, worked there said, yeah, we'll move to Florida. 
this is a business and we're a co-op. We, we all have to have a strong mentality that what Evergreen and Ohio Solar is trying to do is going to work for us in our community. Oh yeah, I work this machine, that machine, that machine. That, I'll be all over the place. <laughs> Everybody learns everything, so we kind of rotate and move around. Yeah, you have to. <laughs> yeah. We own this place. That's an extra reason to go to work, you know. Say like it's a house. If you rent it, not so much, but if you own it, you know, that's a big deal. business developer here in New York City. Uh, our first project is Workers Diner, and hopefully you'll be hearing more about it soon. We're going to be doing a public stock offering in support of this worker cooperative business uh, intended to be located in Central Brooklyn. In addition to that, I'm also pursuing a law degree and a PhD at the City University of New York. Uh, Ethan Earle is the national U.S. director of the Working World. Working World is a very innovative organization that's been working for about seven years now in Latin America and now in New York as well. Primarily uh, taking the microfinance model and applying it to worker cooperatives and they've been helping hundreds of worker cooperatives throughout the past seven years uh, stay on their feet and get on their feet. Uh, Peter Arenas. At the end of the room over there, uh, I've had an interesting relationship with Peter. I've actually, uh, I've managed to finagle a sort of a small fellowship at the City University of New York, and uh, I, my only sole responsibility is to update the political science department's website. And although uh, Peter Rains is a professor emeritus of political science at the City University of New York, I have to work more on updating his uh, website than any other professor in the entire department. I, and that's honest. That's honest to goodness. Uh, I should also mention that uh, he appears to uh, focus ex ex extensively on uh, Latin American politics, particularly Argentine labor and the Peronist phenomena. Uh, he's been publishing, again, as I said, he's been publishing tons in Socialism and Democracy, uh, Labor Studies and Working Class History of the Americas, Working USA, Monthly Review and Situations. Uh, he's in particular published a lot about Argentina. And he's an active member of PSC CUNY. Uh, Carl Davidson uh, in the center here. Uh, although not necessarily politi politically. I, I, I was, I've met Carl before at several uh, worker cooperative conferences, the U.S. Federation of Worker Cooperative, uh, National Worker Cooperative Conference, which is coming up again this uh, summer in Boston in June, uh, as well as at the Eastern Conference for Workplace Democracy, which happens every other year uh, in, on the East Coast, a regional conference. Uh, I met Carl before, but I, I didn't, know, <laughs> didn't know so much about him uh, other than his involvement in the Solidarity Economy Network, but uh, perusing his, his wiki last night was sort of awe-inspiring. I mean, from the SDS to spending a night with Fidel in Cuba, describing to Fidel what a hippie was back in 68 or something like that, uh, to uh, his Maoist activism, to uh, was uh, progressives for Obama and then the New Party in Chicago, to uh, to, uh, to to committees of correspondence, which is an, uh, an offshoot of the Communist Party that was started in uh, what was that? Ninety two. Uh, thank you. And so now, currently, uh, in addition to being uh, holding some position with the Solidarity, Solidarity Economy Network, well, I'm not sure what that was again, but it was board member. Board member. Uh, he is also uh, a 
co-chair of the Committees of Correspondence for Dem Democracy and Socialism, which is this off splinter of the Communist Party. Uh, he's also uh, uh, now. I, I asked Carl. I said, "Well, I know you've had this great history." I said, "What? What should I? What's your passion project at the moment? What should I tell people about that you're really into right this moment?" And he said, "Here you go. It's uh, the, the online university of the left. He had a business card already, and I applaud that sort of uh, you know enthusiasm and preparation." So, uh, without further ado, I thought uh, perhaps. Uh, we can go from uh, maybe Ethan, and then in that order, Ethan and Peter, and then Carl. We could talk could talk about some uh, work cooperatives again, and of course, in international context. Then we can move on to questions and answers. So, okay. Well, um, I guess I'm going to do the best that I can not to repeat all of the same things I was saying this morning, because I recognize about half the people here in the crowd from the, um, the earlier session on worker cooperatives and solidarity economy. Let's see if I can sort of provide a slightly different perspective. Um, the organization that I work for, I've been working for for the last five years or so, uh, the working world has sites in uh, Buenos Aires, Argentina, and Leon, Nicaragua, and also just opened a third site here in New York this past summer. Um, it began as a brainchild of uh, Brendan Martin, who's our founder, who essentially got inspired by the recovered, recuperated, whatever you want to call it, factory movement, uh, and went down to Argentina in 2003, four together with Avi Lewis and Naomi Klein following their documentary, The Take, uh, went down there with them to see how they could support all of these recovered businesses, these businesses that had been occupied and then put into production by the workers following a severe economic crisis in Argentina and a lot of capital flight. Um, and I, I, what they discovered was that Within their capacities, the best thing they could do was to provide financing. Um, there was a lot of activist support. There were a lot of people out there in the streets. Um, the recovered factories had become somewhat of a symbol for, you know, national resistance to, um, you know, sort of the dark underbelly of international capitalism. And so they had a certain amount of popular support, but they. <laughs> They didn't have money to produce, and oftentimes they were occupying really large and capital intensive factories. And they could not get loans from traditional banks because they were not owners of the factories legally. It was in contest at the time, and still is in, in a number of cases. And they couldn't access traditional microcredit, which works you know, with, with much smaller amounts than individuals. So, we opened a revolving loan fund, uh, sort of based on cooperative principles to the extent possible, um, with the basic goal of putting finance at the service of the people of labor and not the other way around, and modeling what we could to best serve cooperative needs. Um, so we've been there since 2000, end of 2004, beginning of, beginning of 2005. We've done about 500, 520 projects, um, not with quite 100 cooperatives, but with, with 60 or 70. Um, we've invested around two and a half million dollars and recovered 97, 98% of that without ever asking anybody to put up collateral and with an explicit uh, deal made that we only want the loan returned with the revenue that the project we work on creates, which ensures that we're never extracting wealth from the communities that we serve. And it also makes us much more engaged partners in trying to bring that project to success. Um, so in 2009, we uh, moved to Nicaragua, opened our doors there um, with the idea of seeing if if this was something that we could replicate in a different context, um, or if it was just because of this very unique situation in Argentina, which was, you know, having, you know, there's 200 recovered factories in, in, in the country, and there's a number of other worker cooperatives in the city of Buenos Aires. There's hundreds and hundreds of cooperatives. 
Um, Nicaragua is very different. There's a long history of cooperativism. Um, in recent times, it's to a large degree become organizations that call themselves worker cooperatives and oftentimes operate much more like producers cooperatives. Um, so you'll have a, a lot of large agricultural units where uh, it's essentially a mechanism for uh, you know, improving purchasing power and bargaining power and reducing tr transportation costs. But there's not necessarily an equal say for all of the workers and in and, and a number of the cases, workers are actually treated quite badly. Um, so it was, there were a lot of challenges, which we can get into in the question and answer. I won't go into, into all of them now. Um, but we have <coughs> sort of begun to do loans there. I've done 30 or 40 projects that have largely been successful and worked with a number of new businesses, which have sort of arisen in large part as a backlash against this idea of what the worker cooperative was turning into in Nicaragua. Um, so then this past summer we came to New York with the idea of trying to bring this South model, this model that, that people had taught us and that we had worked together with, collaborated on with people in Argentina and Nicaragua um, to the United States. And again, lots of challenges here. Things are very different. There's you know, 10 to 15 worker cooperatives in New York um, and there are a number of other different types of challenges. But there are also some really you know, interesting opportunities um, involving some ideas that, that, that we're trying to bring from the South. Again, ideas um, uh, like using eminent domain, domain as a possibility for, for um, turning uh, factories that are, are out of production into worker cooperatives, stuff that, that actually Peter has written about and, and knows better than I do. Um, but generally, the idea of trying to take lessons learned in cooperative communities elsewhere in the world and see if they can, what can and cannot be applied in the United States. So that speaks a little bit to an international context uh, to the extent that, that of what I know in Latin America here in the United States. And I'll just leave it there for now and, uh, you know, but I'm happy to talk about any number of different sort of issues relating to it in the question and answer session. trying to relate um, Occupy Wall Street with the theme of this conference and last night listening to uh, Marina she sort of took the Argentine case and explained it so it, it feels like uh, I would be repeating some of what she had to say which I fully agree with. So I thought I would talk a little bit about the importance of Occupy Wall Street for the succession of, of the working for the success of the working class in the U.S. And I think, um, you know, my reading of Marx is, is that he, in many ways, when he did his um, an analysis of capital at the time, he looked specifically at factories. He was very much a social democrat, <coughs> a reformist within the system. He supported the working class gains and he supported cooperatives. At different times, he would downplay cooperatives when he felt they weren't strategic and national enough. But in his other mode, he would say, this is the perfect case of, of a system that uses the workers as capital. The workers are capital. He's always said that workers are, are uh, capitalist dead workers, in, in essence. And so in this case, uh, the workers are using capital without the capitalists. And they're fulfilling some of the important criteria for the market without the, the capitalists running away with the gains and the management running away with the huge salaries. So I think Occupy Wall Street has given fuel, at least for me, for the notion that it's really time to, for the workers around the country, and now we have the case of the Chicago Windows workers. You recall that three years ago it took six, six days of political support, Obama et al., for, for the, uh, the company to accept the fact that 
they will try to sell the company to a, to another company. Serious Materials was called at that time, and it changed its name to Serious Resources. That they would take over the factory, and the workers could stay. At that moment, I said, "This is a mistake." As Ethan has just implied, I think that would be the moment to use uh, the Chicago City Council or Alderman, whatever they're called there, to use eminent domain to take over the factory publicly, cede it to the workers with some subsidy. There's no question that most workers don't have the income to run a plant themselves. Although many times in Argentina, workers took no, no pay for two months <coughs> to get a factory moving, to get it going. And the argument was always, what's the difference? I don't get paid for two months for creating a new, uh, maintaining a, a factory, or I go on the street where I have no income at all. So to them, it was an easy decision. So I think workers have the same legitimacy as the Occupy Wall Street to occupy their factories. It, it's, to me, it's, it's, it, it's totally in their realm and in their right. Occupy, I'm not downplaying Occupy Wall Street. Occupy Wall Street are people who have seen the light and have understood that capitalism is deep, deeply dysfunctional, but they've been involved in this for six months. Doesn't mean they'll not continue for 15 years. I certainly think they will. But these workers who should occupy their factories have been working for 20 years, 30 years in their factory. And why isn't it their factory? Without them, the factory <coughs> would be nowhere. So the, 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 the factory belongs to them. I mean, ever since Locke and Hobbes came out with their, their notion of private property, we've really gone backwards in our definition of, of private property. Whose property is it? Those who make a go of it, the workers, or those who pre who originally presented the seed money and, and created the, the insert of capital to begin with. I think workers have a substantial critical claim for that property. And what we need is a public sector that supports them. I know it doesn't look positive today, but there are many states that are more progressive than other states. And I think it's going to be a kind of regional struggle because we're going to have to struggle in this area. Unemployment is not going to go down. It's unlikely to go down. And how can we maintain employment <coughs> without workers struggling to take over the factories and maintaining employment? It's very clear in Argentina when a cooperative has a downturn, nobody gets fired. They all take a, a pay cut until things reassert themselves, and then they go back up again. They are, in a sense, the owners and the workers at the same time. And I really don't see it as self-exploitation, which some members of the left look at it, because they say the workers have to work so hard, uh, and they are really self-exploiting themselves. But I, I don't buy that at all. Uh, workers under wages are always being exploited without any light at the end of the tunnel. Here, the light at the end of the tunnel is ownership and fulfillment and involvement. I think Marx would roll over in his grave if he heard the kind of condemnatory practice that some on the left attacked the co-ops. Because he himself understood the co-ops were a subversive element within capital, showing that capital can be run without capitalists. This is a major revolutionary position that Marx took. <coughs> I think factory and enterprise occupations would be would create multiple agencies of confronting capitalism in the United States. I mean, right now, I guess we have about 300 co-ops in the US, and they're mostly small, you know, printing presses, bicycle shops, bakeries, you know, Amherst and San Francisco and so on. But it, it doesn't have to be that way. I think what we need, and, and the trade union movement should be inspiring this, every time an owner of a factory claims bankruptcy or claims that he's moving somewhere else, that factory should be occupied as a, as a reflex, as a generic relationship to that factory. And I think the OWS, and I'm not trying to create as if they're just 
mindless ground troops. They're not. These people are inspired by tremendous ideological sophistication, but they are available to help out the occupation wherever it occurs. I mean, we have <coughs> uh, um, occupied groups throughout the United States, everywhere, and they would be available in every place. And I think factory occupations are the actual place where workers, in a micro sense, are subverting the capitalist ideology, rather than in theory. In a micro sense, they're making it work. Because I've seen in Argentina conservative workers, liberal workers, radical workers, all coming together. It's the best place in the world to socialize all workers as to their role in society. And the cooperatives don't always have a, a strong doctrinaire left position. But within a few months of running a cooperative, they're all very progressive. They understand who the enemy is, the state and the capitalist system. So it's, it's better than, than maybe sharing a series of colloquia at a left forum for them to realize what it takes to combat capital and the state and what it means. The, also the cooperatives, and I see this in Argentina, they provide an organizational nucleus to reach out to the community. Uh, Marina talked about this last night. Uh, since 2004, I visited about 18 uh, recuperated enterprises in Argentina and many cooperatives that are not recuperated, but they fulfill a niche market, a bakery and so on, a restaurant, pizza place, uh, a dough place for making pizza, and so on. <coughs> These, uh, they provide an organizational nucleus to the community. The best case example is the Sanon, uh, factory in Neokin, a ceramic factory that by dint of their, their sophistication, their political wherewithal, they've gotten the support of, of the people of that community, all 600,000. So whenever they went on strike, whenever they tried to defend their co-op from the police taking it over for the private owners, the Sanon family, the people of that town protected the workers, protected the factory, and allowed it to continue. And I think this is definitely what the OWS has shown us. I, I saw data in the Times a few months ago that the average American is very supportive of, of what the OWS people are saying in terms of the, the financial wherewithal, the, the capitalist ethos that we're undergoing the differ differentiation between 1% and the rest. All this is fuel for fire for the co-ops to be a legitimate potentiality in this country. So I think a post OWS culture can emerge and we can have a move towards an economic democracy, uh, a kind of social democracy. I don't mean that we should give up the ghost of, of a you know, socialist alternative, but in the interim, you know, as Keynes said, you know, in the interim we'll all be dead. I think the co-ops are a meaningful short-term proposition that confronts capital where it hurts. Now, this is all in terms of a prelude to what I was going to say today. Now, I don't know if, let me just. Could you say your name, sir? Peter Rennes. Thank you. Um, it was my many years in Argentina before the co-op movement began. I go way back to the second Peronist movement in the 70s. And what I saw, <coughs> and I learned this from the Argentine workers, that you can be confrontational and mobilizational without necessarily being socialist in, in, in Marxist terms. And I saw where workers occupied factories in, way back in 1969 in Cordoba, that whenever there was a crisis, workers did have the reflex to understand that the working place belonged to them. It didn't always work out as the military intervened in 70, in, in, intervened in succeeding years. <coughs> but Argentina has always had a reflex of co-gestion, as the French call it, co-management, so, uh, worker employment. 
So it, it came to the front again in 2001 in the Argentine crisis. And, and our post uh, 2008 is very similar to their crisis. And I think we're in a situation where cooperatives can really explode as well in the United States. I don't see where that is not in the cards. And with the Occupy movements, we now have the wherewithal and the, and the cultural stimulus to carry this out. So I'll leave it there, although I have a lot more to say, but I, I think uh, I'll follow Ethan's model. Yeah. Uh, I've traveled around the world and uh, seen a few different kinds of cooperatives. Uh, China has in co-ops, same in Cuba, rural co-ops. Uh, Mondragon, uh, more recently I went there and uh, studied it more deeply. There's a book up here on it that I've written. I pulled together some of my stuff and put writings on, on Marx and Peter for find uh, them in there. Uh, but what I want to do today is uh, talk about the U.S. Uh, we actually have an interesting history. <coughs> I uh, grew up in a valley uh, near Pittsburgh, Ohio Valley, and uh, all the little towns going uh, down the river from Ohio from Pittsburgh are named uh, Economy, Harmony, Freedom, Community, <coughs> Industry. They're named after virtues because the founders were all the guys that Marx and Engels were polemicizing against when they wrote Socialism, Utopian, and Scientific. They were all, the little towns were founded by different Utopian socialist co-ops, mostly religious. Some of them fell apart for obvious reasons. They didn't believe in reproducing and about the end of the world was going to come. Uh, Robert Owen started one in New Harmony, Indiana. It lasted longer. And for now, most of these are open air museums. Uh, they failed for the reasons that Marx and Engels and Mary broke their critique of utopian socialism. Others came along later and survived. Um, some of them to this day, if you were from the Midwest, you know, you drive across the prairie, come to a little town, you see a big sign that says co op. It's the gas station, it's the grain elevator, all farmers come to the prairie <coughs> farm. Or throughout the Midwest, you go to the grocery store, Hy-Vee, 25,000 workers in the Hy-Vee chain. It's all worker-owned, uh, worker-owned property. The original guy who owned the first two Hy-Vee stores was a German socialist. When he died, he passed it off to the workers. They spread it to the Hy-Vee supermarket chain. It was an entirely worker-owned co-op. In Pittsburgh, we have a town called Vandergrift. Uh, the whole town from 1920 to 1955 was owned by the workers, <coughs> and they owned the steel mill in it too. But finally, the competition in steel in the mid 50s, after 30 years of making a profit and living for workers there, it went under. Plywood. Before the Second World War, all the plywood produced in the United States was produced by cooperatives in the Pacific Northwest. Um, they eventually got put out of business after the war when the government, uh, state governments in the South subsidized cheaper uh, type of uh, pine trees to make hardwood, uh, hardwood out of and they couldn't compete. They also had a weakness in that they were absolutely qualitarian. Everybody got exactly the same way. They were skilled, unskilled, whatever. It was absolutely equal. Except for the women they hired to keep the books. They had to pay them more. <laughs> but, so the U.S. has all these interesting <coughs> history, and it's still ongoing. There's still new co-ops being formed. There are about 400 of them, I think, somebody mentioned. Uh, but if you look at it in terms of the ESOPs, Employee Stock Ownership Plan, they're much larger. There's 13,500 ESOPs in the country, uh, with a left wing, a center, and a right wing. The right wings being basically rip-off instruments, at least the workers of their savings. Uh, and the left wing of them looking a lot like worker co-ops do practice some economic democracy. Uh, so the ESOPs are a terrain of struggle. But the one I want to talk about 
what I know most intimately is in Chicago and how I first learned about Mondragon and Cooperatives and how it first came into my consciousness. Um, there was a factory, um, a number of friends by an RPM called Stuart Warner, produced a lot of buildings, <coughs> parts for autos, a long time. Had 5,000 workers max. But at a certain point, it was down to about less than two, just under 2,000 workers. They decided to go south to get away from the union. And so we waged a big campaign, coalition to save Stuart Warner. And uh, got everybody involved, the workers before it. The idea was that we were going to buy out Stuart Warner rather than let them uh, go away. So we mobilized not only the workers, the uh, community, the churches. Uh, we got a majority of the city council. We got the banks. We even got the mayor to agree to do eminent domain. The whole thing was all set. But at the last minute, what happened? United Electrical Workers, UE, the union, said no and pulled out. And the reason we do not want to run capitalism better than the capitalists. Now, the interesting thing is it's the same union, including almost half of the same leadership, that is now involved in the Republic Windows. So they've learned a few things over the years. First of all, they learned at least try to get another capitalist to buy it out rather than just let it go. <coughs> Mr. Warner, they just let it go. They tried to get the workers a good severance pay. That was their, that was their demand, severance pay. But now, for the second time around, we'll see whether the UE is finally come around to the idea that this is a point of struggle. But that's the main point I want to make. To me, worker cooperatives are a weapon of struggle, a weapon of class struggle. I don't think we can get socialism by having worker co-ops, you know, multiply like mushrooms after the rain. I don't think it's going to happen that way. But I do think that worker co-ops are one arrow in our quiver that we use to battle for socialism, to wage the war of position to secure strong points for the working class along with others. We need our own political instrument. We need our community organizations. We need our trade unions. And along with us, <coughs> we can contend with the work. We can contend with our class adversaries in the political sphere. We can contend with them in the cultural sphere. Why not also contend with them in the economic sphere? And that's where worker cooperatives fit in. They are a school of workers mastering society. If you can run your own factory, why can't you run your own neighborhood? If you can run your own neighborhood, why can't you run your own city? If you can run your own city, why can't you run your own state? If you can run your own state, why not your own country? Why not? And the working class big masters of the world. So that's what comes out of the school that running a cooperative has in the kind of consciousness that begins to develop when workers become masters. Um, obviously, they have to do it in tough terrain. Uh, they have to compete in the market with other capitalists. I think the key lessons that come out of the Mondragon experience is that a factory alone doesn't work. What made Mondragon thrive and survive for 50 years and continue to grow and strengthen uh, quality is that there's a three-in-one combination. It's not enough to own the factory. You have to own a bank, a credit union. Even with Monogon started with a very small credit union, not as one of the largest banks in Europe, Cajalabara, 4.2 billion euros in assets, 1.2 million customers. But it's entirely worker-owned. Half of the owners are the tellers, who sweeps the floor, as well as the bank man manager, and the other half of it is owned by the industrial co-ops that belong to Monaco. The bank is their way of seizing and controlling their surplus value so that they can deploy it in the way that it's in their interest. There's no 
outside element, not one person, the monogon, who doesn't work there and has a share of them, or who has a claim on their surplus value. One exception being the Spanish state, they have to pay taxes. They get a tax break if they give 10% to local schools and neighborhoods and parks and so on. So that's, that's cool. But otherwise, they have total control over the surplus value, which is why you can, well, if you can hang around here, I'll, I'll go to into in depth in the uh, next lesson. <coughs> but the main point I want to leave you with is that uh, we have to find the forms of struggle where we can intend, not only in the political sphere, not only in the cultural sphere, but also in the economic sphere. And those forms of struggle are work co-ops in the other aspects of the solidarity economy network, the solidarity economy movement. Wait, wait, wait. Can I ask a quick You said that there were three keys. One was it's not enough to own the factory, to <coughs> own the bank, so that's one and two. Factory, bank, third Oh, is third one, school. School, yeah, that's what I thought. Was. Source of innovation and new ideas. Didn't they also start doing some of the support things like healthcare, like clinics? Didn't they also start? Yes, they, they, they ended up with their own welfare system. Too. Right. I have but one question. The, the, the groceries in Europe, they're not, they got wage workers over there. I love Madurat, but right. I mean, in point Half of fact, them. yeah. Half of their trans, they're transitioning. They uh, bought them up all at once yeah. because they wanted to block Walmart oh, good. from coming <laughs> into <laughs> Spain. So they had they were cash rich at the time. So they bought up every mom, every convenience store, every supermarket, every mom and pop grocery, every big market uh, that they could. They bought up 200 of them uh, all at once. And so they gradually uh, are transitioning them to worker ownership. They're about 45 percent of the way through that transition. Okay, point. already, yeah, because that concerned me that you know how you lose things over right. time. And they're also consumer owned. <coughs> right, right, right. so, uh, the grocery stores are also consumers uh, own a piece of them. Okay, so we can just open this up for questions. I've noticed that the panel, by virtue of the topics we're speaking about, it seems more like we're really focusing in on what we, what what sort of worker cooperatives in the U.S. or movements for worker cooperative building in the U.S. can sort of learn from experiments or experiences abroad. So that seems like where the talks are going so far. Uh, so please just open this shoot. Just keep coming. Um, I'm wondering, it seems like it's in some of the countries like Argentina and Nicaragua, um, there may be a culture um, that makes it easier to have, uh, to, to create cooperatives and sustain cooperatives. Um, a, a hypothesis is, I mean, I, I think the American culture is very secret, <coughs> uh, uh, capitalist, traditional hierarchy, people identify don't even, don't identify as as having the agency to, to own and run a business. It, it it's um, it's a, it seems to me to be a barrier. It's reinforced in this in the in the schooling system all the way through it. Um, yeah, I, I mean I'm applying to, to business school and there's very little there um, around kind of just this this concept. Um, I know one program at like St. Mary's around cooperatives, but that's all I've seen. <coughs> so I guess I'd just I'd like to just open that question up in terms of like, is the, is the American culture kind of uh, creates a barrier to, to the co-op movement flourishing? The, you know, the, the Argentine working class culture is not that different from the American. There is a great sense the Argentine worker has wanting to create a better life for himself, absorb electronic equipment, uh, sacrifice for his children, very much like the American working class. And yet, they still have the ability to sense when a society is un unjust and inequitable for them. So I don't think there's anything particular in so-called American exceptionalism that prevents us from, from repeating the Argentine experience. Uh, I think the American worker is, is shrewd and intelligent, capable of running a factory. I don't see anything in our makeup. Even some of these evangelical people that we sort of write off, if you scratch the surface of them, they are also committed to justice for themselves and their families. If you can divert them from from the centaurs of the world, and I think that's possible. So I, 
that other people may disagree, but I, I did a survey of the Argentine workers in the late 80s, and they're so similar to the American workers, the desire to have autonomy and equality within liberty. There, there's a, they're like the French workers. The, the right to, to, to live a good life, to have a long weekend, to have vacation for my children. It's very much like uh, the French worker and, and the American worker. I agree that there's a fairness variable that we don't have. Uh, I mean, Ro we have a Roosevelt variable, but that has been so overwrought over the years with the, you know, the, the whole uh, Reaganomics, and Thatcherism. Um, the Argentines went through it too. They had a menum period, but they survived, and they came back stronger than ever. So I don't have a clear answer. You have you hit on something that is a that may be a problem, but uh, uh, I don't think it's overwhelming. You had a comment? I think necessity teaches you how to learn cooperatively. Uh, I've been around the ones in Nicaragua and the Venezuela ones when they were starting some of the women's clubs, and they all say there is a problem. In fact, the more we become a commodity society, and the more we've been in under capitalism, the more individualized we become. And yes, it's it's difficult to get people to learn how to work together, uh, and they still admit to that. But when you need to do it, just like under a boss to get your wage, that was what Marx said. It helped make solidarity among workers, just because that's where you got your money. You know, you had learned right, in the army. I hate to say it, use the army, but it's true. When you really need to learn to do something, when you need it, because otherwise you won't have a job, you'll do it. If there's any danger here, it's that we may not need it enough yet, like some of the other countries. Although there are areas where pockets where it would be pretty good, and and also our laws are much more restrictive because they capitalists get this that it's not good for us to be doing this, and so our laws here are much more restrictive than some of the European countries and some of the Latin countries. Latin American countries had an additional incentive because a lot of their getting ripped off was from outside companies. So if you got a nationalist perspective down there, some of the laws in Argentina. Change. Well, I have to say that, I mean, they pretty much, they, correct me if I'm wrong here, Peter, but uh, they they took the law of eminent domain by, by, by force. I mean, yeah. previously, eminent domain had been used <coughs> mostly by the previous dictatorship as a way of, uh, am I not, is this ringing true to you? It sort of it had been used oftentimes as a way of expropriating people's houses, essentially, to make, you know, uh, the freeway to the airport and so on and so forth and they sort of this was like a creative use of, of the law I don't know if it was completely new but um, when you say they though are you talking about the, the workers people, the factories but then you also had a state that maybe because of imperialism had more incentive to go along with it than we do here if that makes any sense because they see they have two enemies their own workers and you know the outside capitalists so I, I think they were a little more open maybe than they are here. I don't know if that's true. Just a thought. Great, sir. Sir. So one of the things I heard about in Argentina and one of the things I saw personally in Venezuela was uh, uh, different cooperatives uh, uh, kind of sourcing and using each other. created this thing that you were talking about, like a, a real base. Inter-cooperation, it's called. And, 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 and kind of a, a mass uh, of force, you know? And, and certainly in, under Chavez's administration, it was uh, something that the government was certainly uh, assisting or helping. Or, and then I think maybe in Argentina, not as much. Maybe under Kirchner, probably not as much. There's a couple small ones. There's, well, there's the Evergreen Co-ops in, in uh, Cleveland, which are getting assist from the city government as well as some of the foundations. And then there's the uh, there's the Valley the Alliance of Worker Cooperatives, Worker Fox, and yeah, and Western Mass. There's a lot of dozen co-ops there that help each other. It, it's sort of through southern southern, southern Vermont, Vermont. Vermont. Farmer co-ops, uh, uh, rural Massachusetts. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I forgot to mention this. I'm an organizer, first of all. <laughs> 
this is uh, for my newsletter. If you want to get it, put your email on. Was that? Do you feel sufficiently? Um, did anybody want to answer this at a networks? Uh, well, I know that the, according to the latest survey in Argentina, it's like 13 percent of worker cooperatives are engaging in sort of commercial relations, at least with other worker cooperatives. So take that for what it is. It, it's 13%. It, it, is, it, it is actually, I mean, it, it is a significant number and there's something, but it's not huge, you know. Um, and and there, there was a certain <coughs> amount of government support for a time. I think it came out of necessity, sort of returning to what we were talking about before. I mean, there, there was a really, really, really acute crisis in the end of 2001, 2002. I mean, they went from, you know, 7% unemployment to, like, above 20% within. I mean, it was this really very acute crisis, and, you know, it went through, I always forget the number, but four presidents in a week, or five, or three, or right? some, some outrageous sort of, you know, and, and, and and so politicians were grasping at straws, and there was a period at which you know the the, the worker, you know the worker occupations were sort of this the, this point of pride, and um, and there was some support. There was some support from the city of Buenos Aires, from the city government. And that's pretty much dissipated in the last. Uh, they have a conservative mayor that's been in office since like 2007, 2008. Macri, and he's really not been friendly at all. Um, things have been better in some of the other provinces <coughs> during that time. The national government is a little bit more favorable um, and does maintain some relationships with the cooperatives, but um, it's, it's still a bit contentious. It still involves going out in the streets and, and making, making people remember about, about the struggle. Um, that's still a very active part of it, including making the government remember. I wanted to say that I, I think there's a misconception that Americans wouldn't be interested in cooperatives. One is, is that we like to think of ourselves in, in terms of law Americans as we're going to start a new business, we're going to make our own company. And if you look at the history of America, we've had at least three big waves of cooperatives in this country. The first one in the 17, not 17, the 1800s, when the ideas from the original Rockdale uh, cooperatives came over. Uh, George Holyoke, um, kind of bring these ideas over. And most of those went under the pact through 1890 when the banks basically said no money to cooperatives. There was another big one during the Great Depression, but if, if the capitalist <laughs> businesses weren't doing well, there was no money for cooperatives. So a lot of businesses that got took over and briefly turned into cooperatives failed. Uh, and then the 60s, 70s, there was a lot of interest in alternative systems and so uh, when I was living in Madison, there was a federation of <coughs> two, three federations plus independent co-ops of different housing co-ops plus yellow bicycle plus um, uh, one of the dairy co-ops. So when people find out about this, they're like, oh, you mean I can be part of business, own it, and not have to take all the risks? There's a lot of interest, kind of this little perky, oh, hey, there's something interesting. And uh, so... You know, I think this is this is unfortunately where the schools have really failed, or maybe they have really succeeded, mm -hmm. because <laughs> most of us haven't heard of cooperatives unless we run the right person, yeah. and so the fails the schools have failed in that way, but they've succeeded in that most people don't know about. I, I just ran into the, the person who first mentioned Mondragon to me. I was 29 years old, raised a radical left wing communist red diaper baby. 29 years old in graduate school before I first heard of Montreal. You sir in the green shirt? I had a question for Ethan um, about Nicaragua in particular, and kind of you were creating a distinction between the one form of cooperative, especially agricultural cooperatives that have started, you know, that had been developed, that were mostly about you know marketing and uh, transportation, lowering those particular costs, and the kind of newer form of cooperatives. I work in the, the coffee industry, and I was kind of wondering how the new forms of cooperatives and what you guys are doing in terms of raising capital and working to finance these cooperatives, how that interacts with Ortega and the San Diego State at the moment. Because I know he's passing a lot of particular laws for forwarding cooperatives as a particular development model. Um, let's see, I can answer that. We, we so the mayor of, of Leon is a Sandinista and has been very, 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 favorable to our work, um, has been giving us a lot of in-kind support, uh, 
office space and space to incubate new cooperatives. Um, I don't know sort of across the entire Sandinista structure how it has been, um, nor am I as versed in Nicaragua's cooperative history as I am Argentina. Um, a number of the groups that we are working with are uh, worker cooperatives that have actually sort of come out of these large-scale agricultural cooperatives that exist <laughs> in, in, in Nicaragua and have been exploited there and felt that their voices have not been heard, have been paid very low wages, have been paid wages, you know, and they've been very low. Um, and so, but I do think there's an, a, a sort of an element where there, there, there is an element of, of culture, and I don't know how deep it is. I was think going, thinking about what the two of you were talking about in terms of how deep uh, is the culture of cooperativism in somewhere like Argentina or Nicaragua, or how not deep is it in the United States. But certainly, like language is very important, and just having the word cooperative being bantied about, and people say, "Oh yeah, I know about, I know about cooperatives." And I, I think a number of the women, well, it's 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 been um, overwhelmingly women that we're working with in cooperatives in Nicaragua for whatever reason. Um, uh, it is something like they're like, this is what cooperatives are supposed to be like, you know, and and, I, and this is not what they're like in, the, in some of these large scale agricultural cooperatives, you know. Um, so, so I'm not sure how well I've answered your question. It, it's kind of a hard. Are you guys question. working in this sort of line to like root capital and like <coughs> how you're financing operations in terms of using collateral of the product that's being moved itself as? Um, we, we don't ask for any collateral, actually. I mean, so, so I, I guess we, we sort of use the, the word of the cooperative that we work with as collateral, if you will. Um, we require a, a, an approval, an assembly, a good faith approval that the money is going to be returned with the revenue that's generated. Um, and if a project, we work very, very closely project by project. Um, and if a project completely fails and there's a machine that's just sitting in a corner and it's not being used because of project failure, under the worst case of scenarios, we might sell the machine that we bought back and try to recoup whatever we can of the invested money and take the 20% hit or whatever whatever the case may be. Um, so it's not exactly like root cap. I'm, I, I'm actually not sure exactly how root capital works, but I, I don't really know of any organizations that work exactly like ours does. Um, so. You guys are more like Samurai Code. Right. <laughs> sure. <laughs> samurai Code. I like the sound of that. I don't, I don't understand it completely, but I, I like the sound of it. When you go under, you go Harry Carey? <laughs> That's what I was thinking, actually. That's what I was thinking. <laughs> wait, wait, wait. Chris? <laughs> uh, Ethan brought up eminent domain. The thing in the U.S., we've had a lot of court decisions, uh, Kilo in Connecticut and many others before and after a uh, whole town decision in Detroit. The, the courts have been very clear about what eminent domain can be used, and the argument is that it's used for public purpose and for public use. It, it, it expanded from public use to public purpose. So that, you know, if you uh, uh, expropriate it for a school, not everybody uses a school, but it has a public purpose. And the key aspects of eminent domain are to create a better living condition for the community, to maintain employment, and to create a growth and stability in society. And for me, uh, to maintain a factory functioning has all those elements. It maintains the workers on the tax rolls, keeps them off welfare, off, uh, uh, you know, For example, the uh, Medicaid, all the things that conservatives would support, it keeps them as viable members of the community. And we know in many communities uh, the, the problems begin when, when there's unemployment. Poverty leads to crime, leads to deterioration of, of housing, leads to total disintegration of the community. So th there's a lot of potential using eminent domain not for Columbia University or, or a, a new basketball center in Brooklyn, but to pre preserve and protect the workers in their places of work in these communities throughout America. And this is a viable 
potential. What we need is, of course, a greater sensitivity to what co worker cooperatives would mean. In Argentina, there is that sensitivity. Uh, I mean, the, the co-ops in Argentina may be, uh, if you exclude the, the you know, uh, credit unions, the agricultural cooperatives, the utility cooperatives in Argentina, they probably are less than 1% of GMP, the actual worker cooperatives. But they have a place in the context and the culture of Argentina. And so uh, I looked at several cooperatives that had cooperative schools within them, teaching uh, kids in a woodworking factory. They were teaching kids the elements of cooperative. And in a printer co-op, they were doing the same. And in a uh, steel manufacturing plant, aluminum plant, they were doing the same. They were creating cooperative a bachelor, bachelor degrees. Uh, so there, there's a sense that the Argentine cooperatives know that they have to continue socializing. That it's a, it's a long struggle, but it's a, it's a beginning. Okay, uh, I guess two questions I, I, I want to ask, and the second one is very short, so I'm sorry if I wrap a little bit on the first, but um, I I'm, I'm guess I'm kind of puzzled uh, Carl brought up uh, ASOPs as, uh, uh, as uh, a, a variant on um, cooperatives, but I think of ASOPs, it automatically comes to mind what happened with the Tribune Company in Chicago a few years ago, where <coughs> the real estate tycoon Sam Zell came in and literally plundered the company. I mean, the, the details of this are absolutely horrible, where uh, the CEO was paid something like $40 million to give us okay, and there was three investment banks who uh, either loaned the money and then got money for loading the money and then gave opinions that, oh, this is so wonderful, and they made tens of millions of dollars on this. And the company went bankrupt within a year. The, 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 the workers got massive layoffs. They uh, uh, lost pensions. Uh, benefits were suspended. And um, any kind of thing, I mean, you mentioned that there's a big, wide variety of it, and obviously this is a Obviously, it's an extreme example of, of what could happen, but uh, I'd be curious as to what a good example of an ASOP, I mean, the workers at the Tribune Company had no control over anything. They had their monies taken and wound up getting completely screwed. So I'd be curious as to what a good example of an ASOP would be. And my second question uh, is simply, I've been, I've been hearing more about the uh, cooperatives that are starting to blossom in Cleveland, and I'm wondering if, if anybody uh, could, could maybe tell us a little bit more about those. <laughs> uh, well, the, the first thing that what you describe is absolutely true. Uh, that's the right, what I meant. You, know, so you can divide it into three, left, middle, and right. That's an uh, excellent example of the right, basically where the owner uses. An ESOP is basically a financial instrument. It's a where, where it, uh, workers uh, hold shares in the company's stock. And they can have anywhere from just a, you know, 20 percent of the shares to 100 percent of the shares. And once uh, at a certain point, uh, the number of workers still own the shares means that the owner, he might still have shares in it, and get special tax cuts and tax breaks and all sorts of things. So he'll do this for the workers in order to rip them off, get the benefits, accumulate the profits, and strong, shut the place down, and everybody's left holding the bag. So it becomes a, you know, it's just a, you know, a really rotten tool for, uh, you know, ripping people off. So that's at one extreme. At the other extreme, uh, there's a, any number of, uh, there's a well, there's one I know called Chroma Technology, the farm. It's 100 workers. Uh, it's a 100% worker owned. Uh, uh, it's 100% ESOP. <coughs> the, all the workers own 100% uh, of the stock. Uh, so in that sense, it's an ESOP. Uh, the original owner of it is an old SDS guy. Also, it's up in the socialist and tropical world. Uh, they build uh, very high, high end, powerful electron microscopes. So they're all, you know, it's all very high tech. And uh, all the guys are making a mint. Not only do they get to pay themselves a high wage, they get you know, their dividends from the stock and from it um, because uh, they own it all. So that's, uh, and then there are their steel uh, boundaries in uh, Ohio that are 100% owned by the steel workers, in there. and uh, the steel workers are also in the union and they're working out fairly well. Uh, so that, that's on the other end. And then we have something in between, you know, where the, where the workers will own the stock, they'll get maybe a decent contract, but the owner keeps a tight grip on control. 
in terms of setting a direction that he's not that interested in. He might be interested in giving the workers a good contract, but he's really not interested in being workplace democracy. Uh, he still he still runs it, even though the workers have maybe have seventy five percent of the shares. So, so that's that's an in between. Uh, so I'm looking into a, a contested terrain. It's in, in a way, it's like the trade unions itself. You know, 12.5 percent of the U.S. workers are in unions. 12.5 percent of the U.S. workers are in ESOPs. So if we could wage a battle inside the trade union movement for democracy, why can't we wage a battle within the ESOP structures for democracy? So that's that's my one point about ESOPs. Take the uh, take the positive examples from the the ones that are over on the left end of the spectrum and use them to wage battles so, uh, uh, in the other. It's the same way you can wage a battle to, to for greater democracy in the trade union. Uh, so that's why I meant that this is somewhat contested terrain. Some of you are not going to win a damn thing because they're just odd not crooks. Uh, we had a bitter experience with this in, our, in uh, where I come from, but we're in steel, so it was a 100% uh, uh, worker uh, uh, ESOP. And, uh, they got royally screwed by the nature of the structure, by the nature of the fact that you know, banks wouldn't lend them money. They ended up selling out a few shares to gather some capital. The biggest uh, European global steel maker came in, eventually took them over, forced them all out, fired them all, shut down 95% of the plants, and kept one boutique mill. Mm -hmm. And you know, the workers have been doing well for a number of years right because of the nature of the structure of the ESOP, they were not able to keep control, and they got they got the shaft in the end. So that's one of the problems with the steel workers now. They signed an agreement with Mondragon to do worker co-ops, but the first thing they have to do is to overcome this legacy, this negative. You know, you mentioned you know worker ownership to a lot of steel workers. And it's like this. You know, they don't want to hear it you know, because they've been through weird. So you have to overcome that in order to say, yeah, we're talking about something. So the Evergreen Co-ops come in that. They're a little bit different than the Montagon Model 2. Uh, and the reason there is that in Cleveland. In Cleveland, the Evergreen Co-ops. For instance, uh, the, you saw that in a little movie. I said, all these people, these guys are doing work in the laundry there. What it didn't tell you is that a lot of those people are ex-offenders. And they couldn't get jobs. That's part of the reason they couldn't get hired. They're ex-offenders. So, so if you have all ex-offenders on your governing board, what bank is going to write your checks for six million dollars? No. So they had to modify the structure so that the foundations hold or somewhat in trust, and so that the workers' equity gradually builds up over ten years before they get total control. So that was a that was a compromise they made in order to put people to work immediately. If they would have been stuck to the pure market model like the uh, Arismendi bakeries out in California, mm. they might have been up and running, but there wouldn't be any ex-offenders on the board or, or hired at all. <laughs> so, so you had a trade-off there. The uh, Ohio Cooperative Solar is much more interesting uh, because here, uh, they what the workers there have done, there's about 30 or 40 of them, uh, they have uh, leased the rooftops of buildings in Dominican. And on the top of the building, they will put a solar array that is a mini power plant. And as part of the deal, they give cheaper electric power to the building owner, and then they sell the rest to the grid. So they make their money by owning these little mini solar power plants they put on top of all the rooftops. Much of the year in Cleveland, it's in, the weather's too bad to be building solar arrays on rooftops. So what they do in those months is they winterize working class homes uh, and uh, weather, weatherize that very much. So that, that way they keep working year round. And uh, so that's the way that uh, cooperative works in the work, but it's, it's working out, out rather well. Um, I'm, I'm sure you'll we'll talk about this more in, in the next session. Um, but one thing about the Mudrick One model that's kind of been simultaneously interesting to me, but also causing me to have like cognitive dissonance is, is like the hierarchy structure. Um, and because I, you know, I was introduced to the model, um, just the kind of the traditional small co-op where everyone operates on consensus and decisions are made, um, you know, maybe with some specialization and some people having different kind of roles, some more managerial than others. 
but Mondragon follows a, a pretty, a fairly um, set and strict hierarchy. Um, and I'm wondering how that, does that, how that jives, um, the, how does the, the, does that take away from the, the, the spirit of, of, of the cooperative? Does it cause problems in, in kind of, um, in, in realizing the, the ideology? Um, I, I'm just, it's a, it's a, it, we're, I'm with a group that's trying to start a, a cooperative in Boston, and we're trying to consider different types of organizational structures, and, and one of our advisors has kind of really suggested looking into the Mondragon hierarchy approach, and it's something that I'm kind of, simultaneously, like, I, I can see why it would work, I can see why it creates efficiencies, and why it can still be accountable, but uh, also I'm just kind of gut feeling it weird or wrong, and I don't know, I just want to throw it out there and see if we can talk about it a little bit. Well, oh, it's, um, first of all, I, I would say it probably depends on the size of the co-op. There's 120 co-ops in Mondragon. The average size is probably about 200. Uh, some of them are quite large, like the Roars, like around 8,000. Uh, and then in the larger ones, you definitely have a hierarchy. But in some of the smaller ones that maybe have, you know, 50 people in them or less, 20 people in them, uh, you know, there's, the hierarchy is flat as you can imagine. Uh, and they run pretty much, you know, the way a OWS oh, General Assembly runs. The smaller uh -oh. ones. Uh -oh. uh -oh. <laughs> 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 anyway, the point is that uh, the workers themselves in each Mondragon Co-op vote on what they call the uh, one of their. You, they have a, uh, an annual meeting. Sometimes it's it's twice a year, and you have to go. If you don't go, the first time you get a warning. And the second time you miss, you get fined. So you have to go because they want your vote. And the reason why the vote is important for the General Assembly is you do are three things. You elect the leadership, which then will select a management team. You set the capital strategy, you know, what your strategic orientation in terms of your products and your market is. And third, what the wage spread is, from the highest paid to the lowest paid. Now, the average now in Mondragon is 1 to 4.5 waste spread. Well, it so. was up to 1 to 1.6. 1 to 6 is 1. Point. And in the in the highest one, the bank, it's 1 to 9. You want to just explain the, what you mean by wage spread a little bit? First? From the lowest paying worker to the highest paying worker. In other words, the CEO of <coughs> the bank, he gets nine times as much as the guy who sweeps the floor. Okay? So there is a hierarchy, but you have to put it in perspective. What's the average hierarchy in the U.S. firm? 450. <laughs> 350 to 1. So we're talking 4.5 to 1, 350 to 1 in terms, just of, in terms of wage differential. But that's, but but that's the wage. wage. That's the wage. It's not power and decision. Right. Well, it is in a sense, because basically it means, it means a number of different things. I asked, I asked one uh, American who teaches at Mondragon U uh, as a part owner. I said, what, I said, tell me, what's the real school? <laughs> what's what really goes on here? He said, 30, 35 percent of the people in the Mondragon Co-ops are really into it. They really believe in it. They participate in other meetings. So I said, there's maybe 30 percent on the other end are just paying lip service. They're just in it for the money. And then there's people in between. And he says, we have a problem with the young people. The young people, you like young people anywhere. They come to work, they get their money, but they're interested. They're interested in politics, but they're into green politics, or they're into ETA and past nationalism, or the, you know, the third world solidarity stuff. You know, all of, like everybody here, they're, they're like young people anywhere. You know, they don't want to be bothered with you know going to the factory and taking a class on how to be, a, you know, come up with a better product or be a better manager. But if you ask any of them, <coughs> I'll pay you 5% more or 10% more to do the same job for private capitalists, will they do it? Not one of them. Because they have security, they can't be fired, and they get a higher pay than average than any other worker in the same business. And they have a say. They have a say. They have that annual meeting where they get to go and vote. So even the ones who are passive, who are more into bicycle racing, Basket really in the 
<laughs> in fact, one of the best co-ops, one of their co-ops makes one of the best racing bicycles in Europe. Um, you know, they, they, you know, so the, you have to look at these things realistically. I mean, people were people were people everywhere. One of the things, first things they tell you when you go there is, uh, this is not paradise, and we are not angels. So yeah, you have hierarchy. Some of it is natural. You have some uh, some managers who are assholes, and so they have a social committee to deal with that day to day. To battle those things out. And you have some workers who are slackers, and so the management can do the same thing. They can use the social committee day to day to get on some workers' case. But uh, so, you know, I think that the main discipline that imposes a certain degree of hierarchy is that they exist in the capitalist market. You have to have high quality goods and happy customers, and you have to deliver on time. And if you don't, there's a capitalist rival who will. And to do that, you need to be well organized and have some discipline. And that requires <coughs> a degree of hierarchy. You just can't keep on having a meeting. The order's got to be out. That's why right. that's the discipline that's going to be discipline imposed by market forces, by the fact that they, even though labor is not a commodity. None of the workers in Montreal are wage workers. They are not wage labor. They are associated producers. They are not paid a wage. They get a check each month, but it's not a wage. It's a portion of a profit. Labor is not, a, there's no labor cost in the cost type in Montreal. There's only a divvy out of the profit. So if they don't do well, it goes down. If the company does well, it goes up. So that's the discipline that's imposed upon them by the market. And uh, the Paragon model doesn't like that. The Paragon model wants to abolish money and do away with all of that. To what model? Paragon. Michael Albert in Z Magazine, those people. <laughs> the participatory economics. That's the anti Mondragon. The Mondragon without market. The Mondragon without hierarchy. The classless, or he says, my, my Robert calls it the classless Mother God. Um, I think it's a delusion. <laughs> or at least it's, it's it, it, you know, it may, may exist at, you know, his press, South End Press, but it doesn't really exist anywhere else. Uh, and because of the, this fact that they have, the Mother God grows and thrives because it's able to compete. It's able to make a better product at a lower, at a more competitive price with better service than their capitalist enterprises. Why? Because they have this whole layers of hierarchy that aren't there. I, when I went into Fagor, I looked around the foreman. I could have already seen him. You, you, I eventually found one. They have whole layers of them that aren't there. They don't have to pay these guys. So that's a huge saving. It gives them an edge over your average capitalist farmer. You know, for every 10 workers, you have a foreman cracking a whip. They don't have so that's so that's how I would deal with it. You, you look at it, look at yeah, there's hierarchy there, but you got to look at it in context, and you got to look at it relatively. Awesome. Uh, the madman in the green. Yeah, I think uh, what you were getting at, that, you know, how we keep it good without being some kind of purist that can't be bigger than a you know, five-person thing. Uh, the things that I noticed were one. The larger, the bigger the economy of scale, the harder it is to raise money, and that tends to cause you to go to sources that require, like in Evergreen, I believe, you know, multi-stakeholders, and you have uh, you have some, um, you know, you have some shareholders on the consumer end that are not workers that still have some share in it, and then they might influence the decisions in a negative way toward the workers. And when I was talking to people that were doing this incubator out there. They even said, like, they had planned to turn over those workers you talked about, the laundromat workers, you know, the ex -cons. It's this, this this concept of evergreen is being replicated, this attempt to create jobs in low-income depressed areas. That's where underground started, isolated. That's where uh, a lot of them start. And in, certainly in Venezuela, a lot of more for the poor community, you know. So it's, it's how you think of those workers. Can they do, can they run this themselves? Now, they said they were going to have it. They had regular business guys training them, and they were supposed to turn it over within three years, and they aren't turning them over because they have outside stakeholders they're still responsible to you know, for success. In Venezuela, they turned them over. They had a lower success rate, but the ones they've got, 
the work is really running. You know, I mean, I don't know, that's, you know, those are trade-offs. Uh, in Evergreen, because again, where they had to go for money, they went to these anchor institutions, they call them, you know, so they kind of became consumer driven on where they could sell their goods to. In Mondragon, they started with what the workers wanted to make, what their concept was. It's a different orientation. Ours is more traditionally capitalist in a sense, that way, you know, more consumer driven. Uh, I'm not saying I don't like Evergreen, I do, I was spending time to learn about it, but I'm just saying these are things you look at, dangers, when you're setting it up. Uh, you know, out, how much outside influence there is, and then how big it is. When I was, even in Venezuela, <laughs> certainly in Nicaragua, when you went to the big factories that were taken over, you know, just kind of plunked down, they either called them collectors or cooperatives, but they didn't change the internal relationships between the bosses and the workers. And, you know, and I was with some nice entities who was telling me how great this is, and workers were going, can't talk now, <laughs> you know, it's really, it's shitty, it's just like it was under uh, Samosa, you know, but uh, they, it, it's just because they really didn't change the big structure. The ones that come from the ground up, which Mondragon did and others, I think that's an amazing thing, that's, you know, but you just, when you're making them, you want to, you know, you just have to look at the ways you can be influenced and your control can be taken away. And then when the one that you were talking about, some of those companies that used to have pretty good ESOPs, do they do their own management? How big are they? You know, I mean, size seems to be a factor in whether they do their own management or not. If you don't do your own management, are you really running your company? They, the Monogram Corps, elect a general assembly. It's all working. Yeah, that, right? I, I was talking about general assembly then ESOPs. hires management. They do have an outside. From within, right? from, or, from or from another co-op. Or yeah, you would... They drive it from the outside, but if the guy comes from the outside, he has to buy into the co-op. Yeah, because they didn't even ask, hire. You were asking me about the, 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 the you, national ESOPs. Yeah, I was asking about the ones here, like, you the know, ESOPs like, here. Oh, ESOPs, ESOPs here. you know, the left -wing what's ESOPs, the critical what's thing the that makes them bad or good is if they don't do their own management. The is, who's, who's at the core of starting it? If you've got some, you know, mafioso gangster CEO, well. the ESOP he set up is going to have a certain character. <laughs> you have a bunch of left-wing trade unionists. The ESOP they will set up is going to have a completely different character. You know, it, it depends on the core values of the people who, who uh, put them together. But you only get mad whether there's an outfit in Ohio called the Ohio Center for Worker uh, Employee Ownership. Yeah. They're very good. They help set up the uh, Evergreen. Mm -hmm. They help have set up hundreds of uh, very good ESOPs around the country. So if you want to look them up on a website, no, I find out lots of information. And they're very progressive lawyers also. <laughs> you want ma'am in the green hat? Yeah. And then we'll get some more. It's a lot of green. It's a lot of green. I was green. Everyone's like, green. Irish juice. Irish juice. It's a weird coincidence. Um, I, I, I'm not very versed in worker cooperatives, so I'm having a little bit of concern about um, uh, how we make sure they aren't better capitalists than. Um, I think they should be. I mean, I be well, that. except that what we are trying to do is bring about a new world that where we aren't making bombs and we aren't making, uh, we aren't destroying the environment and we aren't, and there doesn't seem to be anything within the worker cooperative, <coughs> a certain structural way that makes them more. Well, I making there, ethical decisions. I, could just jump in. I think the idea and that. Let so, me just so. add my ultimate my ultimate question, which is: Are there cooperatives where educational programs are going on, not to train them to be, not to train workers to be better managers, but to train workers to move toward socialism? And just briefly, I mean, I think I, for me, what, what distinguishes a worker cooperative from a traditional capitalist firm is you actually create, actually, a worker cooperative is actually able to make moral decisions. You actually, a worker cooperative is actually a moral community. Now, what that moral community does is completely up to them. It's up to our own natures. Uh, a capitalist firm, however, is completely restricted towards one, it is a moral, a capitalist firm is also a moral community, but it's an extremely restricted moral community. It's dedicated only to the pursuit of money in whatever way that comes about, right? So uh, I think, it, of course, we're, we're, up, we're left to our own, as far as I can tell, we're really up left to our own devices on this planet. 
and it's really up to us to figure out what we want to make of it, what we want to make of this world. But a worker cooperative structure actually enables uh, this moral community to sort of make a, a wider range of decisions. So, and you right, said, I have to uh, pick a, a symbol for uh, worker cooperatives. Put on a flag, I would put a platypus on it. You know, it's a you have all seen pictures of platypus. They're not supposed to exist. According to all the pre preceding theories, they were impossible. <laughs> The problem with the platypus is that they didn't know they were impossible. They just kept doing their platypus thing. <laughs> so uh, that's sort of what Mom does. You know, it doesn't fit a lot of definitions. It has a moral code of ten points that it addresses all the questions you do. But that's Mom design. Other co-ops might be good. The largest cooperative I visited in Argentina had 480 workers. And they were very conscious of the questions you raised. Um, first of all, in terms of democratic assemblies, each dis each group, the, the melders, the, the warehouse people, they all had once a week they had an assembly among themselves. And then the whole factory, once a month, everything stopped for eight hours. They had a, an assembly of discussion. So they lost a lot of production in that eight hours. But as they told me, we work on two feet, the political foot and the production foot. And the political foot is just as important, raising the consciousness of the workers. And then on top of it, they spent a considerable amount of their budget on, on, on bringing free tiles to the public schools. They, they set up a clinic for the, for the poor people right in the factory so that people had access to their clinic. So they were very conscious of, of uh, having a social face to their cooperative. And many times they had jazz concerts, dances in the warehouse, which is huge. It's like two football fields. And so there they brought the community in. And that paid them big dividends because the community supported them whole hard. So yeah, <clears throat> that sounds great. Uh, <clears throat> I wonder, as a general question, uh, to what degree uh, you would think of cooperatives as a bridge to socialism? I think they're one piece of the puzzle. I think uh, the most interesting question of them is uh, what does Raul Castro do with it? <laughs> He's laying off 500,000 <coughs> workers. Yeah. They're, they're bureaucrats right now. And uh, he's giving them all the resources that the Cuban state can muster to form work cooperatives. He, he's actively encouraging them to sign the state. And uh, Mondragon is one of the models that they're, they're looking at and doing so. So uh, we'll get, in the next year or two, we'll get a very good, interesting picture of how well it turns out under socialism. Yes. If it's under socialism, a cooperative ownership is only one form of ownership. You, have, you also have public ownership. Yeah. Uh, and uh, so it's a mixed economy of uh, public cooperative and private. Uh, that's what my socialism is. Yeah. I, I, I've been very encouraged to hear and just follow up that right. this that group would, in Argentina. It would be interesting to see, what, see how it turns out. Yeah. Despite the pressures of the capitalist market, right. these uh, fellows, all 400 of them, or 450 of them, continue to believe that, uh, uh, that the politics is very important, that the relationship with the community is very important, and so forth. Despite the pressures <coughs> of the capitalist market. So, uh, would I be correct in assuming there that the greater efficiencies that they achieved by virtue of having an extremely flat a hierarchy, uh, they are in fact investing in their own political and community development? Is that, would that be a fair? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. They see themselves as a <coughs> Their lead lawyer, I had a long interview with him, he said the only thing that keeps Argentina from being a really uh, democratic socialist country is not having multiples of Sanon all over the country. Because Sanon in, in micro is a socialist system, a, a democratic socialist company. And they've, they've expanded it so that the whole Neokin community, in fact, two of their Sanon leaders were just elected to the Neokin legislature. And what are they doing? They're continuing to work. Of course, as we all know, legislatures don't do much work anyway. <laughs> so they're able to continue their job and, and be legislators. But the salary that they're getting as legislators 
if it's more than what they get as workers goes right back into the sun on budget. So they're by their activity they're showing what it is to be a socialist. Yeah, I just wanted to add quick, quickly that, that, again, according to the, the most recent survey, it's something like 35 or 40 percent of the recuperated enterprises in Argentina are engaged in investing back into their communities. This is a pretty sizable portion. It's a lot that, that aren't, or, and often cases that can't, because they're really just scraping by. But it's a decision that a lot of these uh, businesses have made. And then also, just returning quickly to the point of, of of Mon Drago and I, you know, I sense like a little bit of, of unease from cooperativists about these levels of hierarchy. And, and we really, it's really important to emphasize that this is a process that took place over a long period of time, and that I mean, we're talking about tens of thousands of, of workers in one of the more competitive businesses in Europe, a, a billion-dollar business. That and these are decisions that they made over a long period of time. We're talking about very, very high degrees of complexity in terms of organization <coughs> across different sectors. Um, so, which, which isn't, uh, from my end at least, necessarily to defend it or disparage it, but it's just to say that this was a decision that the organization as a whole made collectively and democratically over a period of time because of the challenges that arose as they uh, became part of a competitive international market. So, 50 or 60 years. Or right, over yeah. the course of 50 or 60 years, you know. Um, and, and to add quickly, in, in a country that is not always so industrially competitive in Europe. Uh, you, sir? Yeah. Um, I was, uh, I was, I've done some work with, in the great factories uh, in Argentina also, research, and met Brendan Martin actually and had a long interview with this back in 2005. So it's great to, to see the other end here with you. And so I, I was curious. Um, one thing, you know, I got a good picture there of, of uh, the factories, and and, and uh, we talked a lot about sort of internal organization and and their politics. Um, but uh, one thing I don't have a sense of, and I'm really curious if this is one of the three sort of main factors that you're talking about, Carl, was was, uh, was the bank. And I mean, I'm I'm relatively ignorant of. of you know, the financial world, of, uh, the side of things. And, and so I was curious, maybe Ethan and, and anybody else, uh, what it's like to, uh, I, who are some of the, you know, financial, uh, I mean, specifically with the working world, as a, is it like a C, you know, is it a non-profit, um, 401c3? Uh, I mean, like, who are, who's financing? Like, I'm just curious. Sure. Not in terms of research or anything. I'm not. I'm not. You know. I'm just uh, curious in general, what it's like dealing with the financial world, and how receptive they are or interested they are in, in uh, you know, supporting cooperatives financially. Okay. Well, for for us personally, the financial <coughs> world doesn't like us a whole lot. Has never really given us much money. Uh, our original. I mean, our fund right now internationally is is like you know four five hundred thousand dollars. Um, it's a revolving loan fund. So. Nothing ever leaves the fund. Um, most of the startup money came from Brendan. Uh, he left a business that he'd started on Wall Street um, and took all of his life savings and went down and did that. And we sort of built up, you know, little by little money from essentially angel investors early on. Yeah. We eventually uh, got a couple of relatively large subsidies from the Ministry of Social Development in Argentina um, <coughs> for our work in support of the worker cooperatives. Um, and then just a, you know, a certain amount of, of crowdsourcing type stuff, you know, $50 here, $50 there from people, um, and have essentially two, you know, or three angel donors that are committed to paying for our operational costs, which enables us to put all other money into the fund. So. It's been problematic for us, you know. I, yeah. I, I don't want to paint. I, I, I don't think that I did paint an incredibly rosy picture for us because it's not sustainable at this point in time, which is a question for us. Uh -huh. It's also a question as to whether or not we want to get to 100% sustainability because that leads to a lot of problems in the finance world as well. Because if you have two projects um, and one has much higher impact, but the other one is more likely to give you returns on your investment, of course, you're going to there's going to be a very natural tendency to lean towards the one that gives you more secure returns on your investment. Um, that's what it's been like for us. Um, 
you know, I, the, 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 I think the two most um, successful stories of cooperatives on a larger scale, Mondragon, and, and then also, we haven't mentioned it here, but uh, Emilia Romana, uh, um, have both been characterized by this very, the Caja Laboral and, and, and Mondragon, and then uh, a very large cooperative development funds in the um, northern uh, region of Italy, the Emilia Romana region, in which cooperatives are, are that were founded from the fund are required to give 3% uh, of their surplus <coughs> and turn it to the revolving loan fund as a way of making them continue to, to be sustainable and also to collectivize loss. I mean, there's always a certain amount of loss on investment um, because things go wrong in any business, no matter how awesome its values are. Um, so to collectivize loss and, and protect the fund, um, you also see that Lavoc Valley Alliance and Worker Cooperative stuff that uses a similar model. It's much smaller, but it's been successful. They actually require cooperatives to pay 5% back in. Um, I guess the key is the revolving fund. Yeah. I mean, the fact that it's revolving. Yeah, and then so that has been, yeah, the revolving <coughs> funds has been common. Right, you know, but I'm not sure how many other examples there are, if, if either of you or any of you. I, I, in other cases, it's been, you know, got, Venezuela has been government subsidies, right. and, and right. Um, that's obviously the other route is getting you know sort of uh, strong government buy-in, which has its own complications and has its own potential real value as well. Mm -hmm. I, I was just going to add on to that. Uh, so it seems like we need more Bruce Wayne, Batman, Brendan Martin types to take their Playboy fortunes. Well, you know, and honestly, I think that's a, a, a true. I, I, that's what happened and it's worked out for us. I do think that's a problematic, but, but Brendan as well will say, will say the same thing. We both think it's a problematic part of the equation. And as we've been trying to sort of diversify the fund, one of the routes has been like this social entrepreneurial thing. Yeah. And we both really had this really, you know, like the social entrepreneurial world seemed like a world that that, that, that kind of like wanted us and what we were getting, like people were, they, they were, you know, appealing for us to enter into all these competitions, and, and we wound up both feeling really pretty cynical about the whole thing, um, and the way in which it sort of glorifies this, the Batman who John, or, the, right, right. Who, you know, who comes in and, yeah. like, saves the day, the white knight model of right. development, yeah. if you will, which is a really ugly model um, in a lot of ways, and it's, it's really problematic. Um, it's a complicated question how to sort of create, um, I mean, here in New York, we're trying we're, we're, we're talking with a business about the possibility of a, of a much, well, two different businesses about the possibility of conversions to cooperatives, and also talking with uh, a local credit union with the idea being that we would put up a certain amount of first loss capital. Um, our organization, we don't have a lot of money here in, in, in New York, but we have something. We would put up a certain amount of first loss capital. They would put up, you know, credit unions, which are very progressive in a lot of their ideals, but are very conservative with their money because so much of it is tied to the community, um, would put up some of the more conservative and you know, money. Um, and then, you know, and then we would sort of manage the conversion more actively for them because they also, credit unions also <coughs> have a lot of resources for active loan management is another thing you see, which impedes them. I think, well, at least in the few cases that I've, in the few uh, credit unions I've talked to in New York, has impeded them in terms of active projects uh, towards progressive business development. Um, so, but it's an unresolved, you know, I don't know what I, exactly what I just answered, but that's sort of what, you know, how we're seeing the thing. Yeah. If I could just add on to that, uh, there is actually, speaking to this pr problem where we, ha we, we want to support our local credit unions, but they might not want to always or feel comfortable supporting us, uh, there is an effort right now which I'm going to give a big plug to, which is the Worker Cooperative Federal Credit Union. It's a federal charter, it's sort of its documentation, its paperwork, and its, its mission has been approved. Its field of membership has been approved. We're collecting some signatures from worker owners throughout the United States. I'm collecting signatures from worker owners throughout the United States to just demonstrate some show of support from the national uh, sort of worker cooperative community. Beyond that, we need to raise about $250,000, somewhere between $250,000 and, and a million uh, as straight donation in order to just lay a cushion for the credit union. 
So this is actually a real, I was on a, a teleconference call yesterday afternoon. So uh, if you're really interested in this question of financing and, and creating a large pool of capital that might, uh, well, a large pool of money that would be able to be loaned out to well, work for property businesses, I think this is our, our best bet in the short term. It's the work, workercropfcu.org. You can donate now to it if you'd like. Um, and finally, uh, that connects directly to Mondragon, of course, because so one of the real, uh, as Carl was saying, the three tools to this, uh, you know, the real uh, linchpins to success of Mondragon were uh, having, you know, the school, uh, having the factories, having the bank, and um, that's what this what the federal credit union would, would enable. It would enable anybody who's interested in worker cooperatives, anybody who supports worker cooperatives, any worker cooperative business, to all hold their money in this, no matter where they are in the country, to hold their money in this central banking institution, which will then be uh, focused and dedicated to lending money out only to worker cooperative businesses. So, uh, is it on this or? Yeah, point of information that, and this is in system. I, ju I just heard, and it sometimes happens in depressions, the Small Business Administration is now giving money to co-ops. They're doing it through the Northeast, one of these revolving fund things. So they have decided, they're not, they're not making a big deal out of it since it's already called the socialist or whatever, but they are they are giving money, I heard, to cooperatives. And we, there's some law in Congress, too. We actually, and I, I, I thought of this also, and just government isn't, should not be off no, limits. Uh, the, you bet, you, the national, the federal government is giving money to work with cooperatives now. Yeah. And uh, if you're not aware, the uh, New York City City Council recently gave a $150,000 uh, grant to the Center for Family Life in Sunset Park in order to build two new worker cooperatives in Brooklyn. Mm -hmm. So this is something that just happened uh, just a few months ago. They called us. They called us. They said, we'd like to help worker cooperatives. This is, you know, to, it, at the end of the day, they were just trying to gain some, you know, new, new, new audience for Quinn, for Christine Quinn. But, you know, they called us. They, I literally, I got a phone call. How can we help you build work, worker oh, cooperatives? And, uh, I said money, and they said we don't have any money. And they, and they said, you know. And then I said, well, we need money. And they said, okay, well, here's the money. And it was two meetings. It really was simple. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, so, so. I was wondering if there are any uh, larger scale cooperative industries that are in industrial capital production and industrial manufacturing that are working on a more horizontal model versus the vertical model. In terms of your historical description of it. That's interesting, but I was wondering if that kind of becomes the main form of how the, how, how to actually efficiently create goods in industrial manufacturing. I think what Peter was saying, I mean, we were talking 400 a it depends on how large you're talking about. Um, are there other cooperatives of thousands and thousands of people that that, that, that I know of that know, you know, um, Zenon is pretty, is pretty horizontal. We work with uh, businesses that aren't that large again, but industrial businesses of, you know, say, in the range of 100, 150 workers that are that are very horizontal in, in Argentina. Um, I mean, that's pretty big to me, but it, it is a question of degree, I guess, past a certain point. Um, I, I don't know of other examples of, of say, larger than Zanon that, that is that is operating. Um, with, you know, but again, I, I really consider 450 person plant to be a really large, be a large plant in large production. And also, I have the second question. There are a lot of uh, kind of in New York and the state in terms of developing cooperatives. There are a lot of second degree cooperatives that are trying to be formed and developed in terms of, I know at Kaufman, the second degree cooperative are people that manage cooperatives and manage other small businesses into a cooperative framework and supply chains. I was wondering if that same kind of form is <coughs> being developed. I haven't really heard much of it. You guys are more aware of that kind of development. I don't quite understand. I, I, so, if you are a bunch of small business owners that were either cooperatives or not, um, in terms of working within a supply chain to acquire particular goods, you can choose a high CA grocery. Uh, essentially, yeah. yeah. Right. Or in terms of, um, yeah, they can pretty common or a good example is if you have a bunch of people that want to buy milk, they would form a second degree cooperative that would buy milk through this organization, but the, the organization itself is a cooperative of smaller businesses instead of individuals within the central. Uh, so similar to Ace Harbor. Ace Harbor is a kind of co-op. Oh, it is? Yeah. Oh, that's cool. It's kind of like a franchise, though, isn't it? Uh, each, no, each Ace Harbor is individually owned. Oh, 
but they have a uh, cooperative that does all their buying and marketing. So Property they doesn't show order houses. So they can have these uh, good country yeah. prices on the good stuff and stuff they buy. They have a cooperative that purchases a purchase that they can purchase. You can see what we're talking about in Nicaragua with that uh, large agriculture. Business to business. Right. We're not going to work with that. But that's what we're talking about. Workshop. I mean, those things are there. They were there. When I was a kid, a big thing, grain elevator, it says co op on it. So, but that was legitimate. I'm not saying it was illegitimate, but it doesn't seem to me that's what we're. Right, that's arrow, that's something we're talking about. Sure. It's uh, not worker control. And just, so, uh, sorry, we haven't heard from you. What do you say? Yeah, I, I came in late, so I may have missed something that I'm asking about, but all of the co ops. Different forms of cooperatives that you're talking about sound like they're uh, more on the manufacturing end, uh, and particularly in this area, I have personal interest in this. Uh, when you say that, that worker co ops are being uh, at least contributed to by the New York City Council, in New York State or in the Northeast region, uh, are, there, are there any co ops forming uh, that are agricultural? And do you know what kind of support they may be getting? Well, again, I think we're talking more, actually, this goes to what the gentleman over here in Pink said, uh, which is that I think we're talking more about worker cooperatives and agricultural cooperatives are sort of distinct. We would tend to think of, in the worker cooperative community, we would tend to think of those as distinct from worker cooperatives because agricultural cooperatives don't necessarily imply worker control. But, but they can. I, I know of one they called, can, from, I, I know of one called <laughs> Battle Underground that is, that's in Providence, Rhode Island, that's, that's uh, relatively new and doing a lot of really interesting things. And also, it's also trying to wrap that into a sort of consumer cooperative style grocery store, but it, it's it's a sort of unusual model because it's tied at the same time very explicitly to a worker cooperative um, agricultural um, thing. And so that's one example. I mean, I've heard of other ones in, in upstate New York, but I, I honestly don't know too much about them particularly. 